So there's, there's been a lot of things going on, um, research, 70s and prior. So much of the foundation of this physics, you know, is two generations old now. And Tesla's been playing with it for, or was playing with it, you know, in the 20s and 30s. And it's very, very good. Well, you saw his planes, you know, earthquakes and the light the moon. So he understood the amount of energy, the amount of potential that he could harness. It was not, um, not a small thing. So um, we're going to jump to the 50s. And according to Lieutenant Colonel Beard, who was in Army Intelligence, uh, his sources were saying that the Soviets were freaked out by what we were doing in the 50s. And, and the amount of bombs, hydrogen bombs, uh, atomic bombs, nuclear bombs that we could build, they couldn't match us. So he told his scientists, get me something the Americans don't have. And this was in the early 50s. Get me something that they're overlooking. What aren't, what can we do that they're not? So uh, Stalin assembled, and his scientists assembled, you know, several, it was like three or four thousand PhDs to work on what they eventually termed energetics. A way to manage the ether, a way to, to understand um, directed energy levels and, and Tesla's technology. Uh, when Tesla died, and I believe that was 1943, um, we went in, the government swooped in, copied some of this, did his work, and then family, uh, because Tesla died broke, then shopped his papers around the world, and the Soviets bought them. The U.S. government did not buy the papers, so the Soviets bought them. And so, in their push to get something that we didn't have, they went deeply into uh, energetics. And it's Colonel Beard's occurred, uh, opinion that um, they, uh, up until the late 90s, they were far, far ahead of us. And it may have been by 2005, 2006, where we finally reached a uh, parallel. It was asymmetric war, meaning one side had an overwhelming advantage over the other side, and that's asymmetric war. So, this picture appeared in Aviation Space Technology Weekly in 1980 on what the devices would look like. And that's a pretty big, it's a pretty big thing. Apparently, Tesla was so familiar with how it worked that he only needed one transmitter. Um, the, the Soviets needed two, D and E. And then there's all the, this gauging and restriction as you literally create a time dilation between the two ends of the antenna. So you've got the, the two antennas, the two circles, create the wave difference between the two, and then once they head out, you have a fast wave and a slow wave. Once they arrive at the distance, you create a time distortion. You create a differential in the fourth dimension. And with, with that, that little offset of time, energy flows. Just boundless energy flows from that. It creates heat. Or, if it's worked the other way, it becomes endothermic, meaning it draws heat in. So you have this potential to, from here, I could over Reno. Let's open a hole. And in that hole, we Colder as you work through the top of the storm. Cooler because you're going higher in the atmosphere. It, simply, if you want to increase the instability of a thunderstorm, which would then relate to a hurricane, you extract heat off the top of the thunderstorm. You create a more violent updraft. Simple. And so, what uh, he ended up finding was that in the early technologies of this, there were vents. Arctic that the Russians had built way up north, and there's huge steam plumes showing up. And I think, uh, and a quick look because we get over to the satellite picture here. Um, plumes of steam up in, in some of the, uh, uh, the islands north of Siberia. So they were dumping this heat, they 
this is working, it's it's the ability to to kill to draw heat. Heat is the only thing that, that this works with is, is heat. Now we've um, seen that they can dump so much power into something that it fries electronics. I mean, planes have gone down, subs have gone down, um, shuttles. Have Yeah, well, and you use a different medium. You use rice versus sand. 